Okay, so my clock is at the top of the hour. Can we start, Megan? All right, great. Well, thank you everyone for joining this webinar. We're very honored to have a very large group of uh, people, veterinarians from all parts of the globe. Uh, and so we hope you can hear us okay. If you're having any problems, uh, just go ahead and put it in the chat and uh, the Contura folks will, will help you out. Uh, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here as the moderator. My name is Dr. Lori Goodrich. Uh, I'm the director of the Orthopedic Research Center here at Colorado State University. Uh, and uh, we're within the C. Wayne McElwraith Translational Medicine Institute. Uh, this webinar tonight is brought to you uh, by Arthur Midvet Contoro, and it's going to be on new and upcoming advances in equine orthopedics and talking to the clinical uh, research of it all. So uh, again, thank you for joining us. And I just introduced myself. The next person is Dr. Eva and Karina Stark, and she is the Chief Scientific Officer at Contora International. And she has done years and years of work on researching arthromid in uh, joints and other soft tissues. So brings a lot of experience to uh, tonight's talk. Uh, then we have Dr. Mark Cohn. Uh, he is a equine veterinarian, has a very large successful practice in Germany, and also is part of the German Olympic team as currently as the dressage veterinarian. So uh, thank you, uh, Mark, for joining us. Uh, next will be Dr. Jason Lowe, and Dr. Lowe is an equine veterinarian. He is uh, practicing in both the UK and New Zealand. He is a shareholder and director at IMS Vet and has done uh, quite a bit of clinical uh, research and has been following the science uh, for many years uh, on Arthromid. And then lastly, Dr. Meg Green. Uh, Megan is um, a director at Contura Vet and she uh, has been with Contura in a lot of um, different aspects, but brings a lot of experience through the years uh, at Contura and uh, we'll, we'll finish off. And then we'll have, after a, a, our vet webinar, we will have 30 minutes of questions that you can ask questions in the chat uh, and we'll address it the best we can. So with that, we'll hand it over uh, to Dr. Ann Karina Stark. Good evening, everyone. And thank you, Dr. Goodrich, for this nice introduction. I will start with uh, giving some background on company Contour and walk through some of the work we've done on uh, biologic safety of the hydrogel. So the next slide, please. The company Contour is a group of companies uh, around uh, this hydrogel technology. We have Contour Orthopedics, taking care of orthopedic uh, human orthopedics, uh, animal health, that's in the and manufacturing. All these companies are headquartered in the UK. Next slide, please. So in Denmark, where we have a manufacturing facility, we develop and manufacture the hydrogel in specially designed plants with unique equipment. Our company is established in 2000 and a daughter company, a well-established Danish company, and now it's headquartered in the United Kingdom. Our facilities are being expanded right now, and we are making um, the hydrogel in, in a very highly regulated environment. And you're welcome to have a video tour of our manufacturing plant. Uh, when you visit our webpage, there is a link to that. Next one. Uh, as I mentioned, we are heavily regulated. This is a medical device of uh, class 2B in Europe and class um, and we are subjected to multiple federal authorities. In recent years, uh, the new legislation in Europe became very, very complex. So some people say it's even more complex than FDA regulations. We also have FDA approval for one of our products. 
And as the regulatory situation is so that legislation for veterinary products is different between countries, uh, the product can also be registered as, uh, as a veterinary drug. And hence, we have also approval and our manufacturing facility as a pharmaceutical. Um, the next slide, please. Our products have uh, been in use since 2001, and about 1 million doses can be delivered in different for different indications. Our product bulk are made for less urinary incontinence in female, C marked in 2003, and got FDA approval in 2020, and more than 300,000 patients have been treated worldwide. In 21, we sold our product to the company Exonic Simulation Technologies, who consider that being the hottest thing in urology in the United States. But we still manufacture the product. Obviously, we have Atramidvet, it's been in use since 2009 in veterinary use, and Atrosamid for education, which has started uh, use in compassionate use and clinical trials since 2010. And this product is still marked in 21. And available across Europe. We're in the process of registering that in Australia, Canada, and the United States. Next one. So we have considerably a large amount of different testing and during the 23 years, a lot of bench testing, biosecurity testing, and particularly for joints, uh, we have started with healthy rabbits and then work in goats, in horses, in humans recently also in dogs, uh, and we have a lot of experience in, in, on how the tissues react with the hydrogen. Next one, please. So what it is, atomic bed? It is 2.5% polycomite hydrogel. So 2.5% is a cross-linked polycomite, a very tiny amount of, uh, of the, the dry matter, and the rest is water. It is homogeneous, so there are no solid particles, there are no micro beads, um, and it, it is not degrading, it does not migrate, and becomes integrated part of the tissues with a very fine vessel bearing network. The rheologic properties of the hydrogel remember the, the, remind those of normal synovial fluid. So, and uh, with 20 plus years experience now in different indications, both in humans and animals, we have a very good safety profile we can demonstrate. Next one. We have done a lot of biocompatibility testing and bench tests, as mentioned before. The ones according to ISO standards, which are recognized both for European and, uh, and US, US authorities. And on top of that, we worked also a lot on mechanical and chemical stability and, uh, and different other properties of the hydrogel with interactions with tissues, both in humans and animals. Next one. So when the hydrogel is injected in the body, on the left-hand side, you have a schematic indication of the hydrogel with macrophages entering the hydrogel. And then on at the end, uh, when the macrophages are replaced by fibroblasts, you have a very fine fibrous network. On the right hand side, up on top is um, electronic microscopy picture of the gel st structure, providing a matrix, extracellular uh, matrix like structure. And, and on the bottom, two years injection, hydrogen uh, injection in the coffin joint, where you can see the nice. Uh, tissue reactions with no inflammatory cells there. So gel does not induce chronic inflammation. Next slide, please. Joint. In the joint, the hydrogel um, is entered by the synovocytes. And at 10 days in healthy rabbits, you can see comparison to the normal saline injection, there is reaction to the hydrogel. And then the next slide, we can see that at three months, there is a rim of, uh, a sub rim uh, of, of the hydrogel intermingled with uh, the tissues uh, and creating this 
thickening of the synovial membrane. On the next slide, you would see the difference between what happens when this um, thickening of the synovial membrane is due to inflammation, uh, where you can see a lot of macrophage recruitment, fibrous proliferation, and a lot of inflammatory cells. And the right side is thickening of the synovial membrane with the hydrogel, where a few cells uh, remaining and the synovial lining is intact. So there's a difference between inflammation, thickening of the membrane, and thickening of the synovial membrane with the hydrogel. Next slide, please. So what we think what's happening is there is also that the hydrogel spaces out the inflammation when it's injected between uh, in, in the synovial membrane. And we can see there is one uh, sample from human uh, where the gel spaces out uh, the inflammation. So it creates barrier between uh, synovium and the joint space. Um, so it's also larger enlargement in the next slide. And all those studies we have published, uh, there is a data Dr. Love and Dr. Kohle will talk about as well. Um, so you're welcome to read those articles. And the next slide. We have a lot of data in humans with three year data published now. We work on five uh, year studies in several different places in, 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 in Europe. Um, and in total, we have 10 year experience in humans in, in the knee indication with, uh, with a lot of analysis of uh, those patients and very good safety profile. And sustained, let me see, over three years as published, and we will continue with following up patients for five years. Next slide, please. So in summary, our hydrogel has been used for 23 years in more than 1 million syringes and distributed around the world. It is chemically stable, is soft, pliable, doesn't contain any microparticles, becomes integrated within the tissues, wherever you put in soft tissues in the body. It's a very fine fibrous network. It is inert, it doesn't have any chemical reaction of the body, has long history of use, it's homogeneous, non-degradable, and we have extensive clinical testing for different indications across the species. Great, thank you, Eva. Um, I think for the sake of time, we are going to go on to the next speaker, uh, which will be Dr. Mark Cohn. Hello, good morning. Can you hear everyone? Yes. Good, okay. I just told the panelists it's two o'clock in the morning here. My family came home from a party and I'm, I'm uh, trying to stay awake, but uh, yes, I'm really thrilled to be uh, invited and um, Maybe I can explain, maybe next slide. Um, so we've been working with uh, Arthrit now since 2009. Uh, I think 2009 was the year when the first horses were injected. So now we have 2023, so it's 14 years of use in our clinic. In the beginning, we used it on the extraordinary case. And nowadays in, my, in our clinic, um, with a lot of... Um, orthopedic surgeons, it has replaced the hyaluronic acid completely. So we don't use hyaluronic acid anymore, and we've replaced it with a polychromate hydrogel. In 2016, we, um, we took part in uh, safety studies with Rossdale's together um, on a larger number of forces. Uh, so we injected the, um, the carpus, we had a control carpus, and then we will would draw um, synovia at certain times. Uh, so we had uh, day zero, day 14, day 28, day 42. And next slide, actually, we could show we were quite happy that um, there was not anything uh, increased besides the TNC a little bit. But it was uh, actually what we thought is, uh, is normal. If you inject a joint, even with saline, you will have some uh, TNC response. 
which we didn't know at that time that uh, this macrophage recruitation or recruitation, um, I think, um, has a major effect. And uh, Dr. Jason Lowe will talk about this later because this will be one of the mode of actions we are still hunting because it can't be only um, the ones we already know. Okay, next slide, please. So you still, you see um, SIA, all the and, uh, inflammatory um, indicators, they, they stay low. Actually, the two uh, total, uh, so the TNC, the um, total number of leukocytes, they drop after 48 days. And I, Jason, you said after nine months, nothing really is elevated. So um, that's good because you don't want a foreign body reaction uh, on this substance. Next slide, please. Um, Leva sh showed uh, nice slides, and I think that's something we have to know as veterinarians because you have to visualize what's going to happen. So this is not a molecule, it's, it's like a beehive. Actually, you're injecting a, a matrix which will leave the joint completely and will be in the synovium. And the body takes it as a matrix and puts in you know, his, the, their own cells. And this looks really quite on the electron microscope. So the seven weeks after injection, please next slide. And then of course, uh, the company tried to yeah, explain uh, what was going to happen. And the first explanation was, um, it was like one of these super hierarchic acids which stay in the joint and um, um, just uh, working as a lubricant, Let's, like, like we always explained since 10, 20 years, the action of hyaluronic acid. But the, the normal hyaluronic acid we buy will be in the joint for 40 minutes when you label it, and then it's in the lungs. And the cross-linked one from the human medicine, it's maybe four days in the joint. So even there, the lubrication story doesn't seem to work that well. Uh, next slide, please. And, um, so one, one, yeah, that was 2009, um, a guy from, um, from Denmark, Linus Kamets. At that time, he was a camp med vet, so he was a veterinarian doing his doctoral thesis in, um, in Denmark. And he told me about this stuff he brought from America, from a human um, uh, est aesthetic surgeon. And they were talking about the, 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 this human aesthetic surgeon didn't understand why we veterinarians were still working with hyaluronic acid. And um, I think Linus thought they were talking about um, joints. And so he brought some home and treated some very bad trotters. Um, I think they were all out of business. They had no cartilage, little cysts or a massive OA. And then he would tell me, okay, seven out of the 10 I treated were, were running again. Sadly, as I don't buy this because I have, I have people coming to my clinic every month telling me super stories, and uh, so that's what we did. We tried it on a couple of um, our own clinic horses uh, just for to see that there were no adverse reaction. That was fine. And then we started to use it at the very bad horses we had, which we couldn't get into, yeah, into functionality again. And actually, we had the same amazing results. Uh, next slide, please. So we um, later on started a multi-center study, but this, um, these slides I wanted to show you, these are from uh, Linus' um, doctoral thesis. And here he, he's explaining the yellow uh, gel um, glistening uh, substance within the synovial lining. And you can see it uh, on the cartilage and uh, in the pockets of the, of the joint. And um, later on, you can see the, the stained um, slide. So you can see that the gel is integrating into the synovium. Actually, um, you will meet a lot of people who will say, um, I can't do arthroscopy on horses who have been injected with arthromid because um, the, the gel will interfere. Um, that's not true because after 14 days, there is no gel in the joint left. Everything is gone and it's in the intima. Next slide, please. So, um, at that time, we just um, injected a couple of joints, a coffin joint, fat block, with a, uh, a gel was, uh, which was stained with methylene blue. And so if you um, open up these joints within the first week, you will see the gel 
On the top, you can see the gel in the joint on the cartilage, uh, which would explain the mode of action of lubrication. But um, if you go down, then you later on you see after 14 days, there's no stained gel in the joint space left. Everything, it will be in the synovium and um, in the sub-intima. And um, next slide, please. Then a very important study for me to understand what was happening um, was the gold model study from Aziz Nibra uh, at the university in Copenhagen, he was then. Um, so they um, did, I think, a quite clever study. They had goats where they would cut the meniscal collateral ligament and make the cut into the meniscus. Then they trained them on walkers. And um, next slide, please. So they were looking for capsule elasticity. And if you look into literature, there's not so much um, research done on capsule elasticity. And I always wondered, so if you, especially in humans, when they tap uh, the knee, the joints, and they, they will withdraw like 40 to 60 to 80 ml out of the joint. And then the patient immediately had, is yeah, pain-free, but at this takes two, three days, then the uh, pressure comes back and with the filling of the joint and the pressure on the um, joint capsule, the pain comes back. So pain in your joint has something to do with pressure. And uh, on the top one, you can see um, capsule elasticity. So you have the gray line is um, OA joint, and then you have a non-OA joint uh, comparable on the other side. Um, you see the difference, uh, and this is an untreated uh, joint capsule or gold capsule. And you see that the OA joint is far stiffer. There, there's um, uh, not much elasticity in, um, oh, so you get fibrosis. We all know this, especially old people. When you see the fingers and knuckles, they get a lot of fibrous tissue there. And so they, they lose elasticity. And with the elasticity, you increase pressure. With the pressure, you have pain. Now, on the lower one, you see the arthromid that treated OA joint. And um, you see it's almost after arthritis bed, the capsule is almost more elastic um, than on the untreated control OA joint. So actually out of the, the non-elastic capsule, you make an elastic one again. And this helped me to explain what's going to happen because this is a complete new way of treating horses. Normally we, uh, we use um, anti-inflammatories, painkiller, or we bring inflammation or take inflammation. And this is a new mode of action we've never played with, with uh, as, as veterinarians. So this was something I really liked. Next slide, please. And so we started this multi-center study. Um, there were a lot of clinics in Denmark and Germany taking part. And uh, so we would, would treat um, fetlock OA horses um, and um, what I like about this study um, was that we followed them up actually 24 months. And um, next slide, please. And, and actually the outcome of the study was the same. We had like 70% 70, 70 of the treated horses uh, were lame free to much better, um, which is astonishing. Then we thought, okay, we need to be, yeah, go a little bit more in depth because in the multi-center study, it was just, uh, trotting up and the lameness scale of, um, of the AAP. And regrettable, uh, there was no real good control group. So one of my um, um, veterinarians in the TK Lucia, we said, okay, she wanted to do a doctoral thesis. We did this with the University of Berlin with uh, Professor Lisha. And so we wanted to have more, more information on the joints we treated. Uh, so the coffin joint, we picked coffin joints actually, mm, I somehow regret it because coffin joint is not ideal model to, to do things like that because there's so much else involved and so much soft tissue structure in the coffin joint. So I don't think it's a good model to, to demonstrate a lot of things. Um, but here it was 12 horses. Um, they were diagnosed by interarticular anesthesia. They were radiographs and MRI. And they had a history of lameness at least three months with a history of pre-treatment of three months. So they were all treated with Triamcinolone HA or ACS and uh, uh, other regeneratives. And um, after um, they were diagnosed, they were injected with one CC 
And I think that's important. So you shouldn't overdose a structure like a coffin joint. Uh, so one cc is completely enough. I use one cc in the coffin or one cc in the past and, uh, and a half cc in the bosa. So don't overdose it. And at six months, eight of the 12, well, I'm free again. That's almost a 70% Linus Kamas head when he entered our clinic, said he had a new super drug. So two were improved and two were stayed, stayed the same. Please, the next one. And so if you, if you do test things against saline, I think um, yeah, you can test it against placebo uh, as well. So actually, um, so we were talking with Eva, um, I think 90% in the world is treating with HA and trimazinolone. And I think if you want to prove that your drug is better and doing different things, then you have to test it against the stuff we veterinarians really use out in the world, and that's transylone IJ. Um, next one. My suggestion was that I thought that transylone HA would be on the fast, um, yeah, on the fast side, like on the first month, would be much more effective than. Uh, the polyacrylamide hydrogel, because um, we tried to explain it, it's 14 days in the joint, then it needs to grow into the synovium, then the body has to fill it up with cells. And then I'll always tell my clients, we have to wait four to seven weeks till it's reaching uh, maximum performance. And, but here you can see even um, on this group compared to trimazolinol HA, the polyacrylamide hydrogel, even after one month was 55% improvement compared to 15 and then three months was 65 to 40 and six months it was 75. And that is something interesting because what I see in my clients is that treated horses get better up to the eight month. So you get an improvement um, till eight months. Um, and so this is new thinking. You don't have to redose this. 90% of our treated joints I treat once and I don't repeat the injections. And because most of them are really good and they stay good for a very, very long time. Okay, next slide, please. So after that wrap up, I think we've injected more than 8,000 joints in our clinic, uh, but the success of treatment is dependent on your case selection. If you throw arthromid at everything you see, uh, you won't be happy. And so actually my most important thing is you need to do a, a joint block and I prefer 100% positive intraarticular blocks, then these joints, if you treat them with arthromid, you have a real good chance that, 70% uh, like chance that this horse will be fine. And so you, you think what's happening. So if you take, re, re take X-rays, MRI, CT, actually nothing changes to the bad or to the good. It stays like it is. It's just uh, about the, pain remodeling in the capsule. And so out of a thick joint, you make a thin joint and a thin joint is not painful. That's, I think, um, the, the magic about it. And um, so it's a proper case selection. If you take a pastern joint with low ring bone and your block is like 67% positive, you will inject it with arthromid, you won't be happy because it will get a little bit better, but not good. We've treated, um, we started with a lot of coffins, pastern, Fat locks. Uh, um, I know in the States you use a lot of uh, tassel to tassel joints. Uh, we use them shoulder stifles and temporomandibular joints, especially they are really rewarding now when you have standing CT. You will have a lot of little cysts in the temporomandibular joints. And uh, um, yeah, you don't want to drill holes in there. So um, we use that. We're quite happy with the situation. Um, the cyst will remain, but the pain will go away. And so we use it in Bosa tendon sheath uh, meniscal tears. I'm very happy. Uh, it's amazing after almost 14 days when you retake the ultrasound, what's happening to the meniscus. So the gel, I think, fills in and then the body fills in yourself. So that's really good. Our mode of action is not clear enough. Uh, Jason will maybe highlight it a little bit more, but it's, uh, it's increased osmosis. It's more drainage of the joint. So actually you make out of thick joint a painful joint, a thin joint with restored capsule elasticity. And that's, um, I think, the main part. Um, the macrophage, as I said, Jason will highlight that. And what I really liked is that part of our data um, from the was world is now good enough for 
um, that, that has been registered um, for humans as arthrosomid in human knees as injectable implant. Um, that's, I think, very nice. The crazy stuff is um, for a human, it's a medicinal product for now in Europe. We need a, um, a re registration as drug. So um, Contura is uh, applying for registration with the European Medical Agency. And I hope by next year we'll have this. Um, a lot of people ask me about um, doping in FEI. Um, so there is actually the, there's no possibility of detecting this drug um, via blood or urine. And I know a lot of people have tried even after injecting do a high field, low field MRI. Um, with the high field, you might be able to see something within the first three days. And with a low field, it's impossible to detect the gel. So actually there is no um, level of detection because you can't test it. Um, the Scandinavian the racing industry um, got worried because a lot of these um, um, horses who had OA or uh, no cartilage left, um, they went so well afterwards, so they didn't know what go was going on. So they banned uh, arthritis for race horses in Scandinavia. And um, yeah, next slide, please. I think uh, yeah, that's that was about my part, the clinical part, and the history of what we did in our clinic. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mark. Um, nice thorough history uh, and taking us through the timeline. Uh, just want to remind everybody, we're going to get to the end, and then we'll have thirty minutes of questions. So we'll go on with the next, and that is Dr. Jason Lowe. Right. Thanks, Laura, and thanks, Mark. Can everyone hear me all right? Yep. Excellent. Great. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, just go to the next slide there, Laurie, if you can. Um, and this is just for everybody, just to declare my conflict of interest. Um, I am a shareholder and director of Innovative Medical Solutions, and IMS has the market authorization for Australia and New Zealand, and we market Arthromid. It's a registered veterinary medicine in our country uh, or our countries. Um, and again, just for the, I think, the North American people where it's a, a device over there. We don't have device categories in our part of the world and the same as Mark was explaining around Europe as well. Um, so we did register it as a veterinary drug. Uh, next slide. So this was our pivotal study that we did to get it registered. Um, so as both Mark and Ava have sort of been through, there's been a, a you know, number of great studies about around the product. Um, multiple trials, uh, all coming out, interestingly enough, around that sort of 70 up to 80% success rate, which I found interesting. Um, we had three groups of horses, a uh, total of 33 horses randomized into three separate groups and treated with either arthromid, triamcinolone, or hyaluronic acid. The triamcinolone treated group was 12 milligrams intraarticularly. Uh, the HA group was full label recommendations as per the, uh, the, the high innate product. So they had 20 milligrams intraarticularly followed up by two further intravenous treatments of 20 milligrams. Uh, so pretty high doses of hyaluronic acid. Uh, what's really interesting, yeah, we did a, the, the AAEP score, obviously there are no chips or fracture, fractures in the horses that were admitted. Uh, we had an average age range there of two to six years with a mean of three. We assessed them at two, four, and six weeks. Um, interestingly, there was no difference between any of the groups at the two-week time period, but by four weeks, we started to see a significant improvement in the arthromid treated group compared to the two other groups. And by six weeks, that was even more profound. Uh, I think what was really interesting, sort of, like I say, 83% success in our group. These were horses that were all kept in work, so they were rested for 48 hours. Uh, they were in, in uh, race training. The trainer was blinded, as well as the uh, examining veterinarian um, blinded to treatment. So the expectation of the owners and everybody was to keep these horses working. So 48 hours rest and back into work. Uh, the the, the triamcinolone treated group, um, we ended up with 
sort of a, a, a reasonable failure rate in those horses and only three out of the 11, so 27.3% succeeded um, and responded to treatment. Some people sort of question this and I've had a few interesting conversations around that. I think what or how I or my team interpreted those results um, was, was putting triamcinolone into horses and keep working them and galloping them probably isn't the best idea. And I think, you know, probably resting them would, would might give you better outcomes. I think also we should be aware that you compare this to some of the published data. It's actually reasonably consistent. Um, and Laurie might comment on that, but the couple of published papers that we found on triamcinolone also had much higher doses um, than what we used and sort of, um, but, you know, personally, uh, sort of 12 milligrams into a horse's joint is enough for me, um, starting to put more than that and you, you're getting pretty high doses. Um, yeah, the hyaluronic acid, 40%. Uh, resolution of lameness, again, reasonably consistent with some of the other published literature. Um, but you know, no doubt at all that the, the arthromid treated group was, was so highly significant. And the regulators were pretty um, happy with our study. Uh, I think they commended us really on being able to run this in a clinical setting, which is not that easy, as Mark sort of alluded to before as well. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, so I guess I just wanted to talk quickly around where we use it. I have the fortunate position um, of, of talking to a lot of veterinarians. I talk about cases, uh, I liaise with vets all over the world, um, but obviously also a lot in New Zealand and Australia, uh, where we've sort of been working with this product, probably not as long as Mark, but around that sort of eight years now. I think the beauty for us or the vets I talk to, you know, it comes in a preloaded syringe. So it's easy. You, you got it in your truck with you. Um, you pull it out and you can use it. Um, I typically use a 20 gauge needle for injection um, into a joint. I certainly don't have any problems with that gauge needle. It's not difficult to inject through. I think clinically, you just don't get that nice feel that you'd normally get when you know that you're in the synovial cavity. Um, and that's because of the viscosity of the product. So, but once you do one or two, you get used to that and you just got to be accurate with your joint injection techniques. So it's not problematic. Uh, the biggest conversations we have is vets that struggle, <coughs> excuse me, with the syringes because it is a bit fiddly with the lure lock syringe. Um, I know talking to Kintura around that, that isn't going to change. There's quite a a lot of reasons that that syringe is the way it is to protect the product. Uh, it's 97.5% water and we can't afford it to evaporate out and, and ruin the product. Um, so I often will take a nurse with me or have a technician with me when I'm using this product. It's a high value product. Uh, and again, a, an extra pair of hands to pass a sterile tray or to um, remove a, a, a you know, hold the needle with a sterile forceps or something while you remove the syringe can be useful. Um, we very much rest all our horses for 48 hours as per sort of standard intra-articular treatments. Um, what we've found working with the product and talking to trainers and owners and veterinarians is that if you can back off the horse, we get better results. And I think this is where it takes a bit of re-educating your clients um, as veterinarians that this isn't an inject it, gallop and go sort of product. Um, you, if we can get that horse back onto the easy list and in racing, I'd describe that as, you know, water treadmill, water walker, walker, sort of three quarter pace. You can keep them ticking over, keep the, their fitness levels. Uh, you're not resting them completely, um, but just not galloping that horse. And what we find is we can do that for a couple of weeks. And bearing in mind, too, you're treating a lame horse, right? So from a, a welfare point of view, you, you're wanting to rest that horse anyway. Uh, and if you, if you give it that time for the product to get in and work, we seem to see better results for longer. And I think as Mark alluded to, even in racehorses, we're seeing six to 12 months out of a single treatment. And in our sport and competition horse clients, probably one to two years. 
people often ask me about retreatments. Um, we, you know, based on clinical judgment, if the horse goes lame again in, in 12 months or two years, absolutely treat it again. The only other time we're retreating would be as a top-up dose. Uh, in our study, we sort of saw this group of partial responders uh, that sort of get a little bit better. I think as Mark says, you know, reassess your diagnosis. There could be some other issues going on, especially with coffin joints and, and ring bones, et cetera. Um, but, you know, we're only giving quite small doses in, in horses compared to the human literature. Uh, so I'll often sort of recommend a top-up dose because there does seem to be a dose-dependent effect. Um, we're sort of giving, again, interestingly, talking to some vets, we sort of, on a dose rate point of view, I pretty much divide our joints now into mild, moderate, severe, uh, and I'll give one, two or three mils. You know, if you've got an old horse, 18 year old dressage horse on its last legs, as it were, um, the more you can get in there, I think the better. Um, but a younger horse with just a very mild synovitis, we're seeing great responses with just one mil. Uh, if I've got a particularly inflamed joint, so an angry joint, I might actually go there with steroids first, just to calm it down. Or I'll look at concurrent arthromid with, with non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, put it on a course of phenylbutazone or meloxicam, just to sort of calm that joint down while the product's getting in and, and doing its job. And I think that's the big thing. We do see some horses, and I'll be interested in your experience, Mark, that, that do seem to respond even within a few days. And whether that's because we're decompressing the joint, taking some fluid out, I'll always extract fluid before I inject, um, just out of practice and habit, I guess. Um, but really, I don't assess the outcome of my treatment for at least two to four weeks and maybe even out to six weeks in some cases. But certainly, you know, talking to the owners and the trainers around that to say, hey, this isn't a fast fix. This is something that we need to assess and manage this horse and follow up with. And I think that has pretty significant welfare benefits as well. Uh, so, yeah, next slide, please, Laurie. Um, what to be careful about, as I said, really clients wanting or expecting those fast results um, prior to competition. And that's where I think we've really changed our practice. And I know talking to colleagues, they've changed their practice um, ar around just being able to proactively manage the horses, you know, get them in early at the start of their competition season, the start of their race prep, say, hey, we know this horse had an issue as a yearling we know it had an issue in competition last year let's get this product in early in that pre-competition time so you're you're ahead of the curveball and that's where i think we've really managed to um like i say cha change the way we practice and what i find really exciting about that is that instead of being presented with a horse in the middle of the the season that's coming up to a big, you know, four-star event in two weeks. Uh, those are hard horses to get right and to get through competition. Um, and especially if they're two or three out of five sort of lame. Whereas once I've started using Arthromid, those horses, yeah, they can still go sore for lots of different reasons, obviously hard ground and competition, et cetera, but they're sort of less lame, if that makes sense to people. Um, and I have much better chance of getting those through with changing their training with some other sort of ancillary medications, et cetera, um, even the use of orthobiologics or something in those horses. But I'll always sort of start with arthromid, get arthromid in the joint. They just become easier joints to manage. Uh, I've put a note there around infectious arthritis. I think I've talked to a lot of surgeons now uh, over the years um, concerns from the early days about this acting as a focus for infection and, and oh, once I've got arthromid in the joint I can't do anything else. I think as Mark showed there really nicely in his slides the, the products incorporated into the subsynovium, the subintimal space of the synovial membrane, we end up with this new and actually hypercellular synovial cell lining so the joint is essentially regenerated or restored or renewed, it's, it's back to where it was um, the product doesn't float around in the joint space. 
uh, again, we know from Contura and all the, the, the in vivo studies that they've done that it's fully permeable to salts, it's fully permeable to, to um, organic compounds, so antibiotics will penetrate through it. Um, it just doesn't cause a, a, an issue or, or affect the outcome. Uh, I completely agree with Mark. If lameness doesn't block to the joint, you, 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 that's my number one diagnostic as well, Mark, that it's got to block to the joint. If it blocks to the joint, I know I'm going to see a good response to this product. Um, avoid cortisone within two weeks. Um, we could talk about that quite a lot. To me, it's just a bit counterintuitive to give cortisone and arthromid at the same time. We were trying to, you know, we know it undergoes this integration process, so we don't want to suppress those sort of chemotactic factors of the fibroblasts and, and macrophages coming through. Um, I know from a retrospective study in the UK, uh, unpublished data, but they had a lot of uh, about 350 odd horses, 800 joints. A lot of those had um, both cortisone and arthromid and basically it showed that the outcomes weren't any different. So I think just understanding the disease process, the issue that you're dealing with and make those clinical judgments. Um, and what we're finding, I'm talking to a lot of surgeons now that are using arthromid in the post-op, you know, after fragment removal, OCD removals, um, obviously wait a good four weeks, get the stitches out, let that joint settle, um, and then put your arthromid in. Um, but we're seeing great results from, uh, especially like tibiotarsal joints, where often with, we get a lot of young horses with, with osteochondral fragmentation, um, dirt lesions. Uh, and we just, they can become quite sort of chronic synovitis, sort of puffy joints, which aren't so good for sales. And we're seeing great results with those. Also with uh, tendon sheaths. Uh, next slide, please, Laurie. Yeah, this, um, this is just to show, I guess, some of our histology work. We've actually got another paper under review at the moment, pending publication, um, where we sort of go into some of the histology work that we did for, for product safety with the regulators here. And I just think this is a really cool slide. This is a normal joint, um, 14. Um, and if you sort of look at that top picture, those the layers of synovio sites, the intima, um, and that intimal layer is typically sort of two or three cells thick. Um, you then have the subintima, which is that area um, below the joint surface, if you like, where the where the product ends up getting integrated. Um, and then if you if you go to the next slide, Laurie, please. Oh, so this is just a repeat of those scanning electron microscopes that Mark sort of described, looking at that sort of mesh structure or scaffolding, bioscaffolding structure. Um, and then again showing the collagen fibers um, integrated into it. Uh, Pretty sure these ones were 42 or either 14 or 42 days post treatment. Um, so again, just a lovely visualization, I think, and I always sort of, um, you know, clients or, or veterinarians, once they sort of see this, you start to understand how the product's actually working as that providing that bioscaffold. And if we flip to the next slide. So this slide on the left, I think again, just comparing it to that previous histology slide, this is 42 days post-treatment and you see that lovely sort of regenerated um, synovial intimal layer, um, which is now sort of five, six cells thick. Um, and I think the, and what I'm really trying to show here, and as Mark alluded to, where we sort of want to take the research is into this um, into what the macrophage response to this gel is doing, because as Ava described beautifully, there it's a it's not a it's a type of foreign body reaction, but it's not a it's not bad inflammation. Um, it's not a chronic inflammatory reaction, but it definitely does cause hyperplasia and hypertrophy of the synovium. And again, I think it's important to just say it's not a fibrotic reaction. We don't get fibrosis. Um, and again, this is happening at a cellular level, and you look at those scanning electron microscopes, so you can put lots and lots of repeat doses of arthromid in, you're not going to end up with this big, thickened, scarred up synovium. Um, it's just not how it happens. This is sort of stimulating the body's natural response by inducing 
macrophage infiltration into there as part of that integration process. And I just love how, um, I don't know, Mark, is the FEI, I think, have put this on the regenerative medicine list? Is that where they've sort of ended up on this basis? Yeah, that was the proposal. And then and, um, and they will make a new group um, um, which will handle the regenerative medicine. Yes. Yeah. And, and I think this is really exciting. And I know, um, you know, Kinshura are, are talking with with people now around the research and I think Laurie's going to talk a little bit to that too because this this is just what excites me and we've been talking with um, Steph Dakin up at Oxford University in the UK who's just announced some stuff around the human research around this as we've started to identify these different phenotypes of macrophages and the role that they play in disease um, so you know, I think that's where, as Mark said, there's still some gaps in our knowledge, but I think we've got the right direction and we just need to, to chase that till we get to the bottom of it. Um, is there one more slide, I think? Uh, yeah, so these are just a couple of papers. I think Ava showed these as well. And um, that one on the left, especially um, the Manaram and their team uh, at Virginia College there, I mean, that paper came out in 2021. I'd highly recommend anybody uh, re find that paper, get in touch, happy to share it. Um, I think with COVID going on, we all it sort of ducked under the radar. I don't know how much noise that made in, in the US, Larry, but I just think, and I, and I know there's a couple more papers out there too, but I just found that so intriguing. And I, I think, again, it just sets the platform for the future direction of research around OA and, and, and the role that sort of macrophages play. Um, so next slide. And there we go. That's me. Thank you very much. <laughs> great. Thanks, Jason. Uh, that's a, a, a great review of, of the science. And so thanks for bringing us your beautiful pictures of the histology as well. It gives us a much better understanding. So uh, the next one will be Dr. Megan Green, and she will talk to you from Contora. Good evening. Thank you everyone for being on our webinar tonight. And I'm gonna switch gears just a little bit and share with you all a little bit of the Contura Vet vision that we have in our commitment to the veterinary industry, as well as talk about some of our upcoming uh, research, which is really exciting for our team. Next slide, please. So in 2022 of last year and fall of last year, we had the opportunity to become one of the AEP educational partners. And we were the first medical device company to become an AEP educational partner. And as a result of that, you can see how much research we have done as an organization. And so it was something that the AAP took very serious to be able to allow for us to become a partner. And it's because of the research that was done that uh, allowed for us to become part of this prestigious organization and this group of partners. And we're honored to be a part of that group. In uh, July of this year, we actually attended a summit and were able to hear from the AEP board and we talked about the AEP strategic plan, um, specifically with the sustainability and equine practice. And we certainly are in alignment and want to continue to support that vision as well, uh, along with other equine practitioners. Next slide, please. As a result of our partnership, uh, we get the opportunity to sponsor various events. And uh, these are a couple of the events that we are sponsoring this year. Earlier this year, we sponsored the AEP Focus on Podiatry meeting in Lexington, Kentucky. And uh, we will be sponsoring the upcoming Foundational Skills uh, Wet Labs and Conference in Lexington, Kentucky again in October. I've also been able to serve on the planning committee for that. And really, when we think about equine sustainability and practice, really trying to help uh, these younger practitioners uh, hone in on their skills. And so we're really looking forward to being able to work with these practitioners and being able to help them identify ways that they can increase their knowledge, increase their practical skills, and increase their business acumen. And so that's something that we're looking forward to being a part of, as well as being able to catch the wave in San Diego and go to the annual conference. So we're looking forward to seeing many of you all there and hope that you'll stop by and see us at the booth. We're also hosting the welcome party uh, this year, and so hope that you'll join us as well. Next slide, please. In addition to the AEP, we also find that it's very important to partner with other organizations. As you can see, we partner with organizations that are locally based and regionally based, as well as nationally and internationally. And we believe in cross-organization collaboration that supports professional development for veterinarians. 
but more importantly, one of the founding things for Contura is our research and our education around our products and making sure that individuals that are using these products are able to stay ahead of the curve and they're promoting best practices. And together, we feel that we can actually unlock the opportunities of transformation that if we did it alone, it would be slowed um, or almost impossible. But together, we know that we can bring this knowledge um, and education um, for, for these groups to understand what changes are coming forward and, and allow for them to continue to um, be able to pra practice cutting edge medicine. Next slide, please. Just to give you an idea of sort of the upcoming events that we're going to be speaking at or having training opportunities for Arthur Mid Vets, uh, I just wanted to share with you all that we are going to be uh, busy this fall at multiple conferences. And here are a few uh, in October, or I'm sorry, in September, we're going to be in Kentucky hosting uh, and alongside other part partners, uh, specifically opportunities in equine practice, where we'll have 250 veterinary students from all across the country. These are third year veterinary students that we are going to be engaging with and being able to uh, host and then talk to them about um, different types of um, things in equine practice, specifically lameness examination will be going over and then also talking about intraarticular joint injections. We'll also be uh, having a presence at the North American Regenerative Medicine meeting that's coming up in Kona, Hawaii in September. And Dr. Lowe is going to actually be presenting some of the uh, research that he has with an upcoming paper specifically on the histological and cytological changes in normal equine joints following injections with 2.5% polyacrylamide. And then in October, we'll be at the Foundational Skills Meeting, and we'll also be at ACBS, as well as the FAEP meeting, and Dr. Lauren Schnabel will be presenting specifically on biologics of the treatment for musculoskeletal injuries, including polyacrylamide gels, and I will also be personally presenting at the Sunrise Session at that event as well, and then we will also be at ISELP in Lexington, Kentucky in November, and then we will also be at the AEP where you get the opportunity to hear from some of the same speakers that you see tonight, but also you'll get to hear Dr. Aziz Tinnenbar talk about the research and um, the review of the research that's been done, as well as we'll have three different stable talks that will be in the trade show, and you'll get to hear about case-based scenarios with different practitioners from all across the country. Next slide, please. So when we talk about sort of the upcoming research and development, I just wanted to share with you two things that are happening pretty quickly. And so if you go to the next slide for me, please, Lori. Um, the first one, we talked a lot tonight about um, intraarticular use of our product, but a lot of times we get that question about, can you use it concurrently with other things? And so one of the things that Kentura is very passionate about is making sure that we have the data on file to be able to say if you can or cannot. And so because of the requests and information that we've had uh, with that, we know anecdotally that this product has been utilized with steroids, but we are going to actually start commencing this month um, a pilot study evaluating the tolerability and concurrent use of Arthur Medvet and beta-methasone when delivered intraarticularly into the fetlock joint of a healthy horse. And in this, we'll have 10 horses within the study, and they will all be examined. Uh, and then CBC and chemistry, as well as insulin screening tests will be done prior to injection. And then they will be treated with Arthromid 1 ml, um, Arthromid concurrently with beta-methasone, 6 milligrams or 1 ml into this, the fetlock joint. And the horses will be evaluated um, multiple times throughout the study, initially at day 1, 2, and 3, as well as 7, 14, and 30, respectively. Next slide, please. So looking at the primary endpoints, really, again, it's for looking at the safety and tolerability of Arthromid um, concurrently uh, with beta-methasone into the fat block joint, but also looking at secondary endpoints, specifically looking at lameness grade scoring following the injections at those three evaluation days, and then looking at joint effusion as well as uh, pain on flexion and looking at heat scoring. So we're also going to look at temperature and skin reading following injection, circum circumference um, with regards to the joint that's being injected, as well as CBC and chemistry following injection. Next slide, please. So we also have a sister product called Cinnamid, um, and it's considered a new generation of non-surgical joint therapy for dogs. Next slide, please. And with that, um, because I said it was a sister product of our Arthromid, that we have decided as an organization that we are going to relabel it with a dual species label. So in the Q4 of this year, it will now be Arthromid Vet. Cinnamid will no longer be on the label um, specifically for dogs. So it will be a dual species Arthromid um, product, um, will be a medical device for both dogs and for horses. And it will be used to treat non-infectious causes 
of joint lameness in dogs and horses, including both early and late stages of osteoarthritis. Next slide, please. And then commencing this fall, um, we are going to be doing a treatment response to intraarticular injection of 2.5% polyacrylamide in dogs with elbow osteoarthritis. This will be a 12-month study. And initially, we are going to be looking at the primary objective for the study is to evaluate the effect of arthromid uh, in dogs um, with OA using the CBPI or the canine brief pain inventory study scale, and then also looking at secondary objectives, which are to define the amelioration period um, and clinical use for arthromid, and then looking to evaluate the changes, looking at the CBPI, um, Colorado State um, pain scale um, exam, and then the vast lameness uh, scale, as well as looking at goniometry, limb girth, palpable elbow effusion, and concomitant um, medication, as well as looking at the safety and tolerability of the dogs with OA. Next slide, please. So as you can see, we have over 20 years of uh, research that has been shared with you tonight, and uh, we are continued to be committed to ongoing research. And so with this product, we want to share with you all um, all of the information that we have, and we hope that by tonight, um, you'll feel confident knowing that we have this research um, that we can share with you at any time. But more importantly, we're also committed to ongoing research, and we know that we have just a portion of understanding of what's going on with this particular product, and we are continuously committed to learning more. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Goodrich, and she's going to share with you our uh, information with our upcoming study at CSU. Great. Thanks, Meg. Um, really appreciate that and appreciate the ongoing studies that Contora is uh, conducting. So uh, this will be brief. And I just want to, um, again, thank Contora for having this webinar and the, and the speakers that have all um, given their perspectives tonight. Uh, as Megan referenced, we will be ongoing now with a study uh, in 2024, uh, using the CSU osteochondral chip fragment model. Uh, and this model, preclinical model, uh, is has been used to study osteoarthritis in the horse for decades now. Uh, we've had uh, smaller funded stu studies with this model, but we've also been funded through the, Nas the National Institutes of Health, the Department of Defense. We have two Department of Defense studies. Um, ongoing right now using this model, uh, the Grace and Jockey Club Research Foundation. And so it's a, a very well um, reported model. Uh, osteoarthritis and in the horse, probably osteoarthritis is, is more uh, post-traumatic osteoarthritis. And that's something you'll see more and more in the literature uh, these days, PTOA uh, versus the osteoarthritis you know, you see in, in people uh, in end stages and uh, from obesity, et cetera, a post-traumatic osteoarthritis is, is something really uh, more seen in the horse and is the cause of most of the OA that we see, we, we see in the horse. So again, in this model, um, it's currently we have over 20 published studies, and I, I won't mention all of those studies, but uh, the model started out looking uh, mostly at the use of corticosteroids and uh, just to mention a few, Depomedrol, Triamcinolone, Betamethasone, um, uh, substances such as Adequan, Legend, um, procedures such as shockwave therapy, uh, topicals, uh, intravenous and uh, oral supplementation as well, as well as gene therapies. So this is a slide that you can see on your right um, in a, a trial from a gene therapy study. On the left is osteoarthritic um, changes seen grossly and then a treated joint uh, by, by gene therapy and the associated histo below. So this model uh, was started by our founding director, Dr. Wayne Malkorath. Uh, and this was again, decades ago, uh, the ongoing osteoarthritis uh, that he would see in racehorses, usually induced by a chip somewhere, a chip fragment in the joint, and those horses continue to um, race and often be treated with various substances. 
And so that's where the idea was started uh, to induce a chip in a what we call a preclinical model. And so that was done. Uh, and many then again of these studies have progressed and the design has changed a little bit through the years. I'll take you through that, but uh, largely the work of Dr. McElroy, Frisbee and Kowchak have really led to some um, pretty important findings in this model that really mimic what we see in osteoarthritis in the horse. So uh, just briefly, this is looking at the middle carpal joint and this is looking at it as if you uh, were a surgeon and the radiocarpal joint is uh, on the top left there. And so a chip fragment is induced using uh, an, a curved osteotome. And this is a arthroscopic photo down below. So the chip is induced and then the subchondral bone is burred back. So the chip uh, does not heal back uh, immediately after it's made. Uh, so again, that's done in the middle carpal joint. And those horses then are run on a treadmill um, for five days a week. So two minutes of trotting, two minutes of galloping, back down to two minutes of trotting. And again, that's done five days a week. So with that, um, the, the design is this. And again, the design has changed a little through the years. We have eight horses. Um, in the treatment group and eight horses in the control group. So all horses will have an osteochondral chip fragment made, uh, again, on the radiocarpal bone, and a treatment in eight of those horses is injected into the treated group. And in the other eight horses, um, there is a saline injected into that osteochondral uh, fragmented joint. And the reason why we don't make a fragment in each left and right is because some treatments uh, can actually uh, go out of the joint and treat the other side. And that was seen uh, in some of the corticosteroid uh, injected uh, studies. And so it's, this is now the, the design that we use for this um, model. So the horses arrive, um, they get baseline, they ensure that they're um, not lame, there's no, um, there's no problems associated with the joints, we radiograph the joints. Um, then the chip is induced, that's done on day zero. Um, by day 10, those horses then are assessed for lameness and grouped according to lameness. So in both groups of that I just showed you, we ensure that the horses um, grade of lameness is consistent between treated and untreated group. Um, on day 14, those horses are then injected with treatment, and then they begin uh, treadmilling, as I said, five days a week. And so each week, those horses get lameness exams, they get joint aspirates, they get blood draws, um, and then radiographs, MRIs are done at the end, radiographs are done uh, through the study. And the postmortem usually is done on day 70 or thereabouts. Uh, and that postmortem consists of several outcome parameters, as you can see here. So the lateness, so at the end of 70 days, we have uh, lateness exams, again, done weekly, including flexion, effusion, circumference studies, uh, goniometer. Um, from the weekly um, cytology that's done, uh, we also get bio, we look at biomarkers in the joint as well as systemic biomarkers. We look at various things um, from the synovial fluid, but very importantly, um, IL-1 beta, PGE2, those are the markers of inflammation. Uh, we look at gross pathology uh, on 70 days, uh, histology, so um, we do very thorough cartilage, subchondral bones, synov synovial grading. Uh, we look at the radiographic progression throughout the study, the MRI examination at the end, um, and a, a full um, amount of statistics are done to compare treated to untreated joints. So this will be done again in, in 2024, and we're very excited about this partnership with Contura um, to look at this in the horse preclinical model. Some other things that are being considered um, that will most likely be done is in-depth gait analysis um, by Dr. King 
who uh, does an in-depth gait analysis on these horses and um, multiple different types of uh, software programs to look at um, the impact uh, and various types uh, of gait analysis, looking at fetlock angle and carpus angle, uh, et cetera. Um, the tribology is very important as well. So we're excited to look at the biomechanics uh, within the joint uh, with Arthromid. And so there's a lot of uh, work that's done out there in different types of um, gels. And so uh, we are working with a biomechanical uh, engineer from Rush University, uh, and we will be looking in-depthly at the tribiology. And then lastly, Jason mentioned this as well as Mark, but uh, there's a lot to learn about the macrophage um, changes in the joint. And this is a very somewhat new area now in the study of osteoarthritis, but it really, much of osteoarthritis and its progression um, comes down to the macrophage changes within the joint. And so uh, this is a, a graph from um, Dr. Pezanite Dow and Chow, the immuno, uh, immunology group that work, we work closely with. Uh, and this is just showing the blue positive changes of um, macrophages within the joint, the red negative changes uh, within the, in the joint. And so we're looking forward to doing an in-depth analysis uh, of how macrophages change within this model um, through, through the 70 day time period. The study co-PIs of, of this study will be Dr. Katie Seba and Dr. Aaron Contino. They are both associate professors in sports medicine and rehabilitation. Um, I'll be a co-investigator along with several other of us um, that will uh, offer expertise in this model. So thank you for that. And we wanna make sure we leave um, as much time as we can uh, for questions. So with that, uh, I think uh, Michaela will read some of the text questions that people are writing in. So thanks for your yes. attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Goodrich, and for, for, to everyone else as well. Um, we do have a few questions that have come in. One in particular I'm going to start with, um, and I'm, I'm actually going to answer and ask Jason to chime in a little bit as well. Um, the question was about um, HISA and HISA banning Arthromid in the United States and racehorses. And so we could spend another probably five hours talking about this, <laughs> but uh, just to give a brief um, answer to this, this question, last year um, in, in summertime, HISA did propose a 180-day withdrawal period on polycrylamides as a category. Um, the, the ban is on the administration of the pro of polyacrylamides intraarticularly. Um, it was officially um, approved by the FTC May 27th, I believe. We have been in ongoing discussions with HISA um, since last summer, and they remain engaged with us, and we are encouraged that they are dialoguing with us. They're very interested in understanding how Arthromid works. Um, we have differentiated Arthromid uh, from the other polyacrylamides and, and how different the mechanisms of action are between the different polyacrylamides. And we're, we're hopeful that um, at some point soon, HISA will remove or revise their stance on the two and a half percent polyacrylamide that's found in Arthromid. So just know that we are, we're, we're working hard to communicate with HISA. They have been receptive to us and, and we're hoping for a, a great outcome so that this product can be used in racehorses in America. Um, but Jason, I was going to see if you wouldn't mind chiming in a little bit about your experience and what you know about the Japanese Racing Association as it relates to this situation. Yeah, sure. I think you've done a really good summary there, Makata. And, and yeah, look, we had similar questions raised in Australia and in Japan. Um, and we undertook, again, extensive sort of engagement with them, um, have some great conversations. And once those once the people there understand the product, um, the 2.5% product and how it's working, we, we've managed to ally any fears. And I think even turn that narrative around that I just, um, because we all get the concern, right, around welfare and horses and the social license, especially around racing, but any performance sport with horses. Um, but I just know from my practice, 
this is such a positive product because we're not saying to inject these horses and, and, and race them. Um, we're saying treat them, back off them, give them some time. Um, and I think, again, you know, the product's been around in the market long enough now to see we're not seeing big increases in catastrophic fractures, certainly in the racing authorities where, 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 where I'm involved and have input. So, um, so like I say, I think it's great, Michaela, you've got some positive dialogue going. And I know um, once Laurie helps us answer a couple of those other questions as well um, <laughs> around the mode of action, um, I have no doubts that we'll... we'll um, people will see the light but yeah it, it's it's approved in Japan with the Japan Racing Association it's um, it's approved in Australia with the Australian Racing Association uh, and in New Zealand and, and again I think you've got to look at the you know, as a registered veterinary medicine in my jurisdiction it goes through the full veterinary drug um, analysis across toxicology chemistry manufacturing efficacy safety um it's not a you know, it's not a light process it, it's a really heavy process and the, the this product stands up to to any rigor around that so. thanks jason so going through we've got quite a few questions um one of the other questions and this this is probably a a, a dr kuner and, and a jason um low question asking just about um commenting on the redosing of a chronic osteoarthritic joint with Arthromid, and is there a point when you feel uncomfortable with numerous redoses? Um, and another question that we we have received is, what happens if you redose multiple times in, in these joints? Is there something that we would see histologically? So I think that's kind of a two-pronged question that you might be able to answer. Mark, do you have any? Anything? Yeah. As I said, the, the principle is not redosing. Um, it, it, you have to change your way of thinking. Um, 90 to 95 percent of all the treatments is one-time treatment. So if you redose, you have to reconsider it, uh, your diagnosis. Uh, you have to just get into the horse again and um, work your way through the horse. Because mainly, if it's if you need redosing, your diagnosis is not good enough. And you have to adapt your treatment. Um, I, so, so there's only very few horses we read, we read those. Um, but maybe Jason can can say because you have this top on thing. We, I'm not so familiar yeah, with. Yeah. Well, sort of about fifteen percent of the cases, and again, yeah, you know, our our patient basis is very much racing horses. Um, so we found about. 65% would respond really well to a single dose. And we found another 15% were what we termed a partial responder. So you go back four to six weeks later, they've improved significantly, but they're not 100% sound. And we would top up a dose in those. Um, but I agree with you, Mark, the, the, the need to sort of, re well, is repeat dosing safe? Yes, it is. Um, in our safety trials for the regulator, we put up to five times the, the recommended dose rate into joints with no adverse effects. Um, clinically, we've been working with the product for 18 years. I know I've had horses I might have treated three or four times, again, with no, no issues. Um, you don't see fibrosis in the joint. You don't, you know, th this product does not cause granulomatous type reactions. Um, but as you say, Mark, it's your diagnosis. I think if you, if you have a horse that hasn't responded, you've got to go back to basics and, and just reassess your diagnosis. Can I, Michaela, just can I ask Jason on those that you have redosed, what percent response then of the redosed ones um, have you felt like you've gotten to soundness and then is there a more typical joint that you've had to redose when you've done that yeah i think we, we mostly deal with knees um, middle carpal joints we have a saying in australia especially if it's not in the knee check the knee <laughs> because it's just <laughs> where we see the issues um, i think the partial or some of the partial responders have a component of subchondral bone disease in conjunction with intraarticular disease um, and I think those respond less well um, for obvious reasons. And then it becomes that overall management. But I think uh, 
So I guess really to answer your question, that, well, yeah, coffin joints are different again, because as Mark said, you know, multifactorial, lots of stuff going on in there. So the ones we probably repeat most often are knees, probably because that's the case, the cases we see. Uh, I feel we probably, if we get a partial response to one dose, we'll see 80, 90% of those respond even more to a second dose. Um, and then those ones that just, uh, and that's that, um, that tribology studies, I think that'll be interesting around that. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Thanks. But Laurie, I have one more comment. I think I now get it with the redosing because um, it's different joints. I, I know in the US you do a lot of bone spell and then tassel mid tassel joint. So I started to do them when I got the information from the US that they were quite happy with that. And so I used them, which were not responding to children and local injection. And I had really good results, but those you have to redose mainly maybe after a year or something. Mm -hmm. I redosed them. And then my result was not that good as with the first injection. It didn't last for a year then. Um, that's that's my uh, experience with redosing, but th th um, that would be explained because I think in the US a lot of hops are injected with that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. So another question that that we get quite often uh, that was asked this evening is um, what's known about the synergistic effect between arthromid and orthobiologics. Nothing that I know of. <laughs> I, I just, I, I just, I don't think there's a synergistic effect. I think that I, I just feel that once you've got a um, arthromid into the joint, as I said, they become easier joints to manage. And there's people with much more expertise in orthobiologics than than me. But I always felt I, I did see some spectacular results with with um, IRAP. Um, but it was sort of random. And, and I think the more I've learned about joint pathology it's it's really that timing of intervention and i think that's the critical thing that the more you work with this product the more we work out when to use it and that's where we've just started using it earlier so i'll always start with arthromid and then if i've got a a young horse that's you know coming into some big races or something yeah i might still go to irap or something but I'm not as, um, I use it a lot less than I ever used to. That's my experience. I, I think uh, the, the question is, is there any negative effect? And um, so we, we used to do arthromid alone. Now, out of logistic reasons, because the horse is traveling so far, uh, I have no problems using it combined with prostrate or PAP at the same time. I've never seen adverse reactions or negative effect on that. Do you feel you get an increased effect by combining them? I can tell you, I, I, there's not, you know, um, yeah, it's not like a really good follow-up study. You send them home and then you just hear it's good or not. I think yeah. um, I have, there's not not enough data. I just know it's uh, it's it's not detrimental or negative. And as we know, the gel is used a lot for stem cells. So it, it doesn't really uh, harm stem cells. It actually, it's used for uh, stem cell harvesting. So I think um, that because it's inert, what that nothing has really happened. And sometimes with PRP, we know the antimicrobial effect of PRP. So um, that could be a benefit as well. I just add to that, um, Michaela. I think it's a it's a really interesting question in whether or not there's an additive effect and i think you know again from the clinical study side it's something we should investigate uh, because on those non responders um mark said mostly you know he's uh, around 70% and i think jason you feel you're roughly around that um response as well so can we make that better with orthobiologics, um, I think that that's a really important question that we should study that um, also. Yeah, Good. definitely. Thank you. Okay, we've got a few more questions. So moving on, um, is there any data on possible disease modifying effects yet? Um, an example, less osteophyte formation, years out, cartilage depth, maintenance, et cetera. Mm. 
Um, not that I'm aware of. Um, yeah, not that I'm aware Maybe of. Maybe soon. <laughs> Maybe in twenty at the end of twenty twenty four. Yeah, I'm yeah. not aware of any either. I think the the clinical results you see, uh, and that's what changed me. You know, when I when I and it's interesting hearing Mark, you know, when, when Lee came back from a, a pub in England and had heard about this product and and I said, oh, well, let's get some out and try it and and stuck it into some of my patients. So I just went, wow, this is, it was just so different. Um, and, you know, lucky enough, I guess, to work with horses long enough to, to appreciate that difference. But I think for anybody that's questioning whether they should use it or start using it, it's it's a no-brainer. It's just it helps your practice and helps the horses, and you get happy horses, happy owners. So. Yeah, yeah. Jason, I have a question that was directed at you specifically. Um, we have a vet that was asking what dose you are using in the tibiotarsal joint. Yeah, I'll typically uh, one to two mils. Probably try and use two mils. Uh, we treated a 680 kilogram horse the other day we put three mils into that it had a, a, a chronic OCD fragment removed previously um, but yeah one to two mils and again bearing in mind we're, we're working a lot with younger thoroughbred horses so yeah yeah sort of 400 okay. 450 kilo horses Great, thank you. Um, a question about uh, using NSAIDs. Should we be using NSAIDs in the first few days following injections? I, I often do. I'd be interested in what you do, Mark. But yeah, if I've got a, 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 a sort of an inflamed joint, and it was interesting, I was talking to some vets in Australia recently that if they said if they get any joint with a synovitis, they'll try and sort that out before they put arthromid in. Um, and they were getting good results with that. But if I've got a, you know, what I'd call an effused joint, you know, maybe a two or three out of three on, on flexion, um, passive flexion, um, then, then I'd be using some, some non-steroidals with it. What do you yeah. do, Mark? Yeah, normally I don't, um, but I think it's always uh, case related. Um, what I always do, I use uh, local anesthetic method okay, and a little volume uh, pre-injected into the joint and then follow up with the syringe. Um, because I know from the humans that the injection can be painful. So it's the inflation of the capsule. And then most of them, I don't give insights. And um, because I think that this pain situation is immediately after or during injection or after injection, if you overdose, over volume, or if the fibrous capsule is just too painful. And, um, but if you have a really lame horse, um, yeah, and I want them to walk, I never rest them. I, 48 hours they're rested, but then I want to get them back. Oh, oh sorry, my dog. <laughs> and, and those I will put on the inside. Okay, sorry. <laughs> So we did have a question about intraarticular anesthesia and um, asking whether or not arthromid can have an impact on intraarticular anesthetic procedures. Yeah, but yeah, and no, it's again, it's fully permeable. It's it's it doesn't react, and in humans, as Mark's just saying, they'll, they'll use it concurrently. I wonder with that. Mark, if your dog stopped barking, um, <laughs> because they use such high doses and humans you know they're putting six mils i know it's a quite a big surface area the human stifle but um and i know again talking to to people that have humans that have had this treatment it could be quite intensely painful um and they talk around a 30 percent sort of flare rate in humans uh, but i do wonder if it's that higher doses and probably more chronic joints as well i i think if you if you look into human stifles or dog elbows or whatever um the, the situation is like the, it's looking on the moon they, there's no cartilage left it's only bone and i think that the moment when the tip of the needle hits part of the bone that's like you they get an electricity bolt on and it's very very painful and we don't have these situations too much in horses so when a horse is lame you have oa and you have some degradation and they are lame but it's not the same situation as in humans i think it's the mechanical touching 
of the bone, which is so, so painful. Yeah. yeah, and I wonder with that too, because we sort of, like some of the vets I've talked to, a couple of them sort of, oh, you know, we seem to see quite a few sort of flares post-treatment and then other vets I talk to, and I know yourself included, you, you, you just don't see flares. And I wonder if some of that's injection technique or scraping cartilage or something, um, join it. We did have a question about the incidence rate of flares. Um, and this particular question, there was a, a comment made that there's a lot of chatter on catastrophic flares on various social media platforms here in the US. Um, I, I can speak personally to what we have had reported to us about the incidence of flares in arthromid treated horses, not about polychromides in general, but we see about a one in 3000 um, rate in, in joint flares. And, and these flares, they resolve with NSAIDs, rest, cold hosing, uh, hand walking. And so it's they're, they're pretty self-limiting and require pretty minimal care. So as far as catastrophic flares, we've not had any in the, the two years that Arthamid has been available in, in the US, we've not had any catastrophic flares reported to us. Nice. Um, there, there have been some septic joints that have been reported, um, but I think that's that's a different category than uh, uh, a true uh, joint flare. Yeah, yeah we're, we're sort of, if you look like the literature, um, Aziz's literature review, I think in the, the published studies on Arthamid, it's about 0.004%. Um, my personal experience and again sort of combining the likes of Mark's practice and, and ours and others in Australia and New Zealand at 0 0.005 so about one in 2000. Um, I, I don't want to get political but I do wonder about the difference between the hydrogels and if there's confusion over them because I think um, that there are differences and I do think that the when you look at the publication from Narens and Schmidt around the difference between the hydrogels, because you know you can literally make hydrogels in a bathtub, and Ava might want to talk to that. But the um, yeah, the, the difference in, in the sterility of them and the the uniformity of the cross links, and then going back to those scanning electron microscope images, I just see that uniform bio scaffolding allows the biocompatibility. Um, so I think the incidence of flares that we've seen with this product is extremely low and well less than I used to see with hyaluronic acid when I used to use that in practice. Um, that was uh, that that was sort of uh, <laughs> you'd hold your mouth, you'd, your tongue in your mouth every time you use that, especially if you weren't adding cortisone to it back in the days. But I don't know, yeah. Mark. What have you seen flare rates, Mark? What are your sort of thoughts on? on reactions uh, i think one in three thousand just covers it i think that's that's uh, yeah that would be normal which is uh, i think very very low yeah. but i heard of uh, different gels used in uh, other parts of europe with a uh, much higher incident of adverse reactions with really bad things and some of these gels you know they're made uh, for um, for humans, so um, you know they, they inject them under wards for to slough them off, and I think if you use these in joints, um, you have a lot of subchondral bone disease, or a split or a fissure, and the gel goes into that, then you get this sloughing of diseased uh, tissue, and I've seen some amazing X-rays where you just see like a very round structure under the under the bone which is just just sloughed uh, because of these gels and that is uh, that can be very detrimental yeah yeah thank you along the same lines we do get questions um quite often um about septic joints after the treatment with arthromid and does using arthromid predispose um, or exacerbate a septic joint if you do have a septic joint um have either of you experienced that um I, I i don't believe so and i think when you look at the chemistry and again i don't know if ava's still with us or not but the um the the, the, the gel's fully permeable to antibiotics and stuff it's not sitting in the joint space itself it's integrated um I believe in the in the few well, I guess the number of cases because I've sort of taken the calls on on some of those from around the world. 
Um, I, I think it's it's that change in mindset that I think if you'd see a severe reaction, they're probably a severe inflammatory reaction. You know, the body treats us as a foreign body initially. And so it's a sort of hypersensitivity type of reaction. So absolutely exclude sepsis. Um, that's normal, right? But I think once we've excluded sepsis, um, we have to treat these as inflammatory conditions and you don't want to keep winding that joint up. And I think that's the worst case. I have had you know one catastrophic case. It had severe subchondral um, sort of pod lesions, so complete bone collapse at the back of its fetlock. It wasn't a good case for, for anything. Um, but it had multiple arthroscopic flushes, multiple doses of intraarticular antibiotics, sort of high doses, acidic dose of an acid um, uh, antibiotic and I think it, it just got wound up and wound up and and what I sort of talk to vets now is if you get a a, a a flare reaction obviously you suspect sepsis but take your joint tap and have a real close look at that because if you're seeing bacteria if you're seeing a whole lot of neutrophils I'm going okay that's probably an infection if I don't see those and I'm seeing actually more macrophages or monocytes I don't see any bacteria I'm going, well, hang on, this might just be a severe inflammatory reaction. So I won't go into that joint. I'll treat it quite conservatively. And as you said, Michaela, sort of um, regional perfusions with, with DEX, um, you know, strong non steroidals, cold hosing, um, ice packs, that sort of stuff, just calm the joint down. And we've been, uh, say, the, the, the few that the handful that we've dealt with around that have all responded really well. Some, a couple of them took two weeks and it's pretty nervous we all get that when we're in clinical practice um, but I think just just change our mindset and understand what the product's doing um, and I don't know Laurie if you've got some you're, you're a surgeon um, <laughs> how would you what are your sort of thoughts yeah I wouldn't treat it any differently I, I think um, again like you said it's been shown that antibiotics can get through there and um, you're going to get at it from the surface if you're putting antibiotics in and then you're going to get at it from regionally perfusing the joints as well so i wouldn't change anything i i would treat it the same very good well we are running a little bit over we do have quite a few more questions we've got about 10 more questions so what what i would like to do is send a follow-up after after the meeting uh, in the next few days addressing the remaining questions that we have um i'll pass those questions around to the panel and, and get your input before we send that along to the attendees this evening um, but want to thank everyone so much for your contribution for staying up until two o'clock in the morning dr kuner and eva it's very very late for you all um so thank you so so much for your time. Um, and Dr. Goodrich, if you have anything else that you wanted to say, um, I'll just pass it over to you. Yeah, no, thanks again to the speakers. It's really great having both the scientific side uh, and the clinical scientific side and talking about the exciting studies coming up. So we really uh, appreciate Contura's willingness to, to have this and um, look forward to continuing to delve further into some of the clinical science that we're going to do with you all in uh, the next year. Cool. Thanks, Laura. Very thank excited you. as well. Yes, thank you all. Have a great night. And we will send an email with a link to the recording of this video for everyone to have um, for future reference. So thank you thanks. all so much. Thanks, Mark, Jason, Eva, Meg. Thanks, Michaela. Yep. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.